Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on the UN SDGs to reorient internationalization of higher education. This webinar is the first of a series of webinars that the Center for Global Education and Internationalization at Sheridan is hosting to mark International Education Week. These are a chance to connect with international education scholars and to share experiences, knowledge, and expertise. Information and registration on the other webinars can be found on our International Education Week events page. We'll paste the URL into the chat for those who want more information on those. My name is Herbert Sinock. I'm Sheridan's Director of Sustainability, and it's my distinct pleasure to moderate this session today with an outstanding panel of experts who will share their insights with all of us today. The UN Sustainable Development Goals serve as a useful framework to address global challenges through development of knowledge, skills, competencies, and partnerships. Our discussion today centers around how colleges and institutes and higher education institutions in general can engage with the SDGs to inform and broaden both the scope and thematic focus of their internationalization and global engagement, whether that's through research, pedagogy, or community industry partnerships. Our panelists will address emerging practices to embed the SDGs into, into internationalization efforts of post-secondary institutions. A couple of housekeeping items just before we begin. We encourage your participation in today's discussion. Since only our panelists are unmuted during the session, if you've got a question for any of our panelists at any point during the event, you could post it under the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of the screen. Once all of our panelists have finished presenting, we'll have the opportunity for Q&A with them, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, I also want everyone to be aware that we're recording the event to permit future viewing and access. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the land on which we gather has been and still is the traditional territory of several indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, the Métis, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Since time immemorial, numerous indigenous nations and indigenous peoples have lived and passed through this territory. We recognize this territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and the Two Row Wampum Treaty, which emphasize the importance of joint stewardship, peace, and respectful relationships. Sheridan College affirms that it is our collective responsibility to honor and respect those who have gone before us. Those who are here, those who have yet to come. Grateful for the opportunity to be working and living on this land. We also acknowledge that many of our speakers come to us from a wide range of backgrounds whose land and history has been largely shaped by indigenous peoples. Sheridan College reaffirms our commitment to honor and respect the rights of indigenous peoples everywhere, both at home and abroad. I'm going to introduce our panelists right now um, each will present for 15 minutes once we've heard from all of our panelists and they have the opportunity to respond to your questions. I'd like to point out that uh, we originally slated four speakers. Uh, Beth Eden was to join us as a youth representative. Unfortunately, she's been called away and is unable to attend today, um, but we wish her well. We hope everything is okay with her. So with that, let me introduce our three panelists today. Charles Hopkins, holds the UNESCO Chair in Reorienting Education Towards Sustainability at the York University Faculty of Education. In this role, he serves the UN Global Education 2030 Agenda with his research and by coordinating two global networks, the International Network of Teacher Education Institutions and the Indigenous ESD Net Research Network focusing on the education of Indigenous youth. He's also advisor to the Global Network of Regional Centers of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development and co-director of the Asia Pacific Institute on Education for Sustainable Development in Beijing, China. Denise Amio is president and CEO of Colleges and Institutes Canada, which is the voice of Canada's colleges, institutes, and polytechnics, and an international leader in education for employment in over 25 countries. Throughout her career, she's worked in policy programs and corporate governance in social, scientific, economic, and cultural areas, 
She was president and CEO of a federal crown corporation and has worked at very senior levels in three federal departments. She's recently been appointed to the Future Skills Council by the Government of Canada and also sits as past chair of the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics and on a number of national, provincial, and local boards. John Helliker is the Dean of Innovation at Sheridan College. He previously taught directing in Sheridan's Advanced Television and Film Program and founded the Screen Industries Research and Training Center, which is one of Sheridan's six research and incubation centers. His background in international education and development includes six years of study in the United States and China during his undergraduate and postgraduate education, graduate work in development economics and international relations, and script writing multiple educational television programs on international development. And with that, I'd like to invite our, our first speaker, Charles Hopkins, to start things off with his presentation. Take it away, Charles. Well, thank you very much, Herb. And um, I guess uh, what I want to begin with is uh, to talk about uh, two global approaches of uh, embedding um, the SDGs into internationalization efforts at, at post-secondary institutions. So uh, the first approach is um, is addressing the current reorienting of internationalization in post-secondary education that is going on in general around the world. And then the second approach is the recognition uh, of the valuable contributions that education, public awareness, and uh, training could make in the quest for a more sustainable future, and in particular, the role of post-secondary educations. Because I see these two can work in harmony and, and in synergy with uh, the current reorienting of internationalization practices and perspectives and uh, the, the request of higher education to become involved in, uh, in, with the SDGs. So let me begin with uh, comments on the first approach, that is the, the current conceptual transformation that is already going on. Now, globally, the concept of internationalization uh, is itself is broadening, especially in Europe. Uh, the European Parliament now defines internationalization in, in post-secondary uh, education policy as the intentional process of integrating an international, intercultural, or global dimension into the purpose, the functions, and delivery of post-secondary education. And the purpose of this is to enhance the quality of education and research for all students and staff and to make a meaningful contribution to society. Now, this is a, really an expansion. So this, this broader definis, uh, definition and conceptualization gives uh, direction that aligns nicely with the Sustainable de uh, Development Goals by emphasizing that internationalization is not a separate entity or a, a separate goal in itself, but needs to be directed towards the overall quality improvement. And it, it should not be of interest to only a small elite uh, group of students and scholars, but directed to all members of the academic community, faculty, students, admin, et cetera, and that it should make a, uh, a clear contribution to society. Now, European countries have really taken the lead in promoting strategic thinking about internationalization at the, the national level, creating national policies. And uh, while only 11% of countries, the research shows, have national internationalization policies and strategies, two-thirds of those countries are, uh, are Europe. And uh, they have programs such as Erasmus+, Plus, and Horizon 2020, et cetera. Now, there are global concerns, too, that 
can align with the sustainable development goals. For instance, linking the global to the local uh, is now seen as imperative in, uh, in internationalization. Longer stays, reducing short-term mobility, uh, you know, uh, eradicating stays of under eight weeks, et cetera. Making a mobility in programs like Erasmus Plus obligatory carbon neutral. Huge shift. And, and that aligns not only with sustainable development goals, but also with the thoughts of, of many young people. Using more sustainable forms of transport, reducing administrative travel, and um, supporting more uh, actively virtual exchange and collaborative online learning. And addressing the lifelong learning needs of uh, immigrants. And, and refugee populations. So these are, are, are some of the trends that uh, are going on within internationalization that are already underway that I think could nicely align with our call for institutions to address the SDGs. So if we look at the slide that is up, I just want to take a few moments and talk a little bit about uh, the historical perspective of that second aspect, the, the call for higher education and post-secondary education to become engaged with sustainable development. So we see, you know, back in 1945, the UN being created not only to prevent World War III, uh, but provide structure for the for the future recovery and internationally coordinated development and so on a place to uh, to meet negotiate collaborate on huge global issues and the huge global issue that is facing us currently is how can we uh, collaboratively create an economic and social system that enables individuals uh, communities nations to thrive equitably while simultaneously sustaining the capacity of the planet to provide for future generations. Interesting, this is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, and I think we all realize that within the United Nations there are specialized UN agencies, and UNESCO is the particular one that we work through largely is it's focused on education, science, and culture, and it's the lead agency for education's role in sustainable development. Now, if, if you look at the slide, you'll see that there has been a, a progression uh, because of trying to face that huge global issue. The United Nations uh, created a, uh, a uh, an inquiry, sort of, with the president of, of uh, Norway in, uh, to try and, and resolve the conundrum between the need to address abject poverty and the need for development in the, in the developing countries and around the world, social justice, how do we blend that with the need for environmental protection of the planet for future generations? So we have in 1987, the Brundtland Commission coming back, the UN accepting the overarching concept of sustainable development, and then coming up with programs since then as to how to actually implement uh, sustainable development. So in 1992, we had the first of three plans. This was called Agenda 21. And it ran from 1992 to 1999. It took advantage of the new millennium coming in. And uh, from 2000 to 2014, we had the eight goals of the millennium development uh, goals that ran. And then from 2015 to 2030, we now have 17 goals with 69 targets and all countries are to implement it. With the Millennium Development Goals, it was limited to a small number of developing countries. But these are global goals that for several years, there was global consultations online under a campaign called The World We Want, and they came up with these particular uh, goals. 
Now, all three of the programs, the Agenda 21, the Millennium Development Goals, and the Sustainable Development Goals that we currently have, all three of them recognize the need for education, public awareness, and, uh, and training. And for, for uh, the current one, this week they just released a roadmap on education for 2030. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, in uh, 2017 and again in 2019, the, the UN General Assembly recognized that Education for Sustainable Development, or, or ESD, was a vital means of implementation for sustainable development. And as an integral element of both the sustainable development goal on quality education, but a key enabler of all of the sustainable development goals. Now, this is an important aspect for post-secondary. As these, these 17 issues will largely dominate the economy of the future. These are wicked issues that are not going to go away. And our students' awareness and their ability to engage with these issues will be an important aspect of their, uh, their success and their own uh, personal well-being. Uh, plus, we can, we can count on by addressing and weaving these into all of our teachings and, and all of our departments and subjects and so on, it will make our curriculum more, more relevant as we take the global and bring it to the local and, and work back and forth. The other aspect is the concept of not seeing the goals independently. Think of it as, as a, um, uh, oh, a, a patchwork quilt, if you like, where you have one patch. It, it, it's not really going to, you know, to, to keep you warm. We have to think of this as an integrated whole. And the same way as trying to implement the, the, uh, the sustainable development goals, we need to think of it at the institutional level in the same way. We need to think of it as a whole institution approach. And uh, how, can, how can we do that? Can I have the next slide, please? Now, <clears throat> as well as education being, and training being part of, of all of the goals, we have right after um, uh, uh, addressing poverty and hunger uh, we, and health, we have education. And so we have our own specific target and a goal, the goal being to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and for us in, in post-secondary and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. We also see that uh, within the targets, we have a, a target on affordable, quality, technical, vocational, tertiary, and university education. We have a target on skills for employment and entrepreneurship. And we have a target, 4.7, which on the slide you can see is by 2030 ensure all learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development through both education for sustainable development and also through global citizenship. So we have these three that uh, are, are all Im important. So if we could have the next slide, please. So we have these two, one being education for sustainable development, and both of these uh, global citizenship education uh, and uh, ESD are complementary to one another. The ESD focusing on knowledge and skills that would come from, from the, the courses and disciplines within our institutions, and it, it's uh, to, to try and address the, the complexities and also social justice. It's not just about environment. Uh, and then we have the global citizenship aspect that uh, addresses sort of the social sciences and brings about how do we actually engage and bring about change and so on. So both of, of these aspects of sustainable development 
fit nicely in an overlap with what we are already, uh, already doing. Both of these have a similar vision of a more sustainable world. The pedagogy of interdisciplinarity, um, addressing a sort of phenomena base, that is problem based, place based, opportunity based versus uh, exploration just limited to a particular discipline. Both of them intend to be transformational, both in skills, perspectives, worldviews, and so on. And these align with the international reform goals that I talked about uh, at, at the beginning of how do we even envision uh, internationalization. So could I uh, uh, have the next slide, please? So we talked about some, some of the challenges and, uh, and uh, the, the successes. Well, the first, the great challenge, before we can even begin at, at creating uh, uh, global citizens and knowledgeable of the sustainable development goals, we had the challenge of engaging our post-secondary itself as a concept, as an institution. And then how do we engage faculty? How do we engage administration? How do we even address the expectations of, of, uh, of our students? These are huge challenges that are being faced around the world. And how do we do this in, in this whole institution uh, manner? So that's the first huge challenge. The second one is getting, getting beyond the idea that it's just about humans. Sustainable development itself is very, very human-centered. It, it's really about the rights and, 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 of all life on, on the planet. The third challenge is clarifying the concept, moving it beyond the environment. It's beyond turning off lights. I mean, that's really important, um, you know, addressing the environment. But addressing social justice issues, gender issues, all of the different aspects of the SDGs uh, broaden our perspective around what it means to be a global citizen. And, uh, and we, we do have uh, successes. We have, uh, for instance, through technical and vocational education and training, uh, that's the TVET initiatives, really focusing on reorienting um, vocational education around the world, uh, particularly as a scheme of getting to help the small to medium-sized enterprise. Big business gets it, and they have their own vice president sustainability and so on, but it will be our colleges and so on that will focus more on, on small to medium size. So if we start to look, uh, lastly, the way forward, there is good news. There are, there are a lot of, of uh, first of all, countries that are recognizing this is important. We're coming up with targets and monitoring schemes at, uh, uh, for countries to report through UNESCO on, on what uh, progress that they are made. And institutions themselves are, are coming forward. Uh, one one big example is the uh, International Association of Universities, um, because I'm just talking about the, sort of the global. I think in some of the other speakers will talk about what is happening in colleges and universities and so on here in Canada, but around the world, the International Association of Universities has put together clusters of universities working on each of the sustainable development goals. Uh, goal four, the one that focuses on education itself, is being led here in Toronto by York University, but it has in its network a number of, of, uh, of universities representing all of the continents and, and a 10-year program from 2020 to 2030 working on that. The University of Regina is taking the lead globally again on sustainable production and, and consumption. Now, I think in closing, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of international offices within our institutions and the need for them to, uh, to uh, sort of assert and claim a role at, at, at the heart of the discussion regarding this, this whole change. Um, there is this 
I think international offices should become leading players in changing the worldview of, of post-secondary education itself. To see internationalization not as the, the commercial venture that it's sort of seeing now. How many foreign students can we bring in for the income and, and so on? But rather, post-secondary education is, is a kind of social enterprise that faculty and students are, are, are proud of, proud to be a part of it, and rising to see how, how they can, can be a component in this larger vision. And at the same time, not, sure. uh, not doing with the work of uh, helping those people uh, at all, but uh, with a way of collaboratively uh, creating a better world. So um, let, me, uh, let me close with this, with the, the concept of not seeing the goals uh, as independent, but as a quilt through a whole, whole institution approach. And uh, I look forward to uh, comments and, and, uh, and questions in the future. So last slide, and thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, I see uh, Denise has jumped away for a minute, so perhaps uh, uh, just comment. Uh, there are um, so many amazing thoughts you've offered in the middle of this. It's already prompted a couple of questions from our audience members, which we'll address uh, as we return. Um, had me thinking, uh, I loved your phrasing of wicked problems, and it, it had me thinking about the nature of those problems are um, we, we could perceive as um, the ending or seeing the weak points of some very traditional models we've had that have held with us for a couple hundred years that are now transitioning or need to transition to these more collaborative, inclusive models and the role of education in that. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll be very interested to, to kind of pursue that, that line of thought during our question and answer. And thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Denise, you are just in time to get going. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, I had someone at the door. <laughs> what a timing. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for this invitation and congratulations to Sheridan for organizing this. I have to say I really enjoyed um, the presentation done by, um, by uh, Charles. Uh, when he talked about a whole institutional approach and that SDGs are not only about the environment, this is so important to remember. So today what I will do, I will talk to you about uh, what we do with respect to the SDGs, how we have embraced the SDGs, both at the domestic level and at the international level, and also share some opportunities for the audience uh, to be involved in the SDG. So uh, very pleased. So first, maybe it's good to see who we are, uh, Colleges and Institutes Canada, in case you want to have the abbreviation. It's very easy. See. I can, so see, I can. So we represent, in fact, more than 135 colleges across the country. So it's urban, rural, remote. You can see the map of Canada. It's an extensive network that many of the audience are part of. And uh, in fact, we can now say that 95% of Canadians live within 50 kilometers of one of our campuses. And uh, this, uh, and 86% of Indigenous live uh, within 50 kilometers. So it covers about 3,500 uh, communities across the country. And in case you wonder in the middle, Bay James, you see a dot, in, because all the dots represent the different campuses. It's not a mistake, there's an island there, and there's a campus in the middle of uh, James Bay. So uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, when we talk about the uh, SDGs, what is very important is to look at them in a holistic way because you cannot uh, just think about one of the SDGs. Of course, because we are in education, uh, uh, SDG number four is a key one. And uh, this is certainly something that uh, is influencing us a lot in what we do. It's all about quality education and uh, ensuring that equal access for all women uh, and the men to affordable and quality technical, vocational, and tertiary education. And so this is very key. And us at uh, CICAN, the way we've approached this is that uh, on top of focusing on SDG 4, we've been focusing on three other um, SDGs, so 5, 8, and 13. Uh, the, and we do have so many opportunities, in fact, to touch to all the SDGs, as I will mention earlier, because of uh, the different 10,000 programs that we are offering uh, in the different uh, programs and because of the broad range of people that we work with, uh, whether students or faculty. And when we look at those, I will go in more details in each of them. So if you look, for example, at the next slide, the SDG 8, uh, which is Promote Sustain Inclusive and Sustainable Economic Growth. So, of course, with our education for employment, our work at the international level, this is something that we have, um, that we have uh, embraced very, very much uh, through our EFEs, meaning our Education for Employment Initiatives, uh, where we work and we support uh, uh, developing countries, in fact, that want to adopt uh, an employment-focused approach to post-secondary education. So when we look at our EFE projects, we have about 40% of our members that have been, uh, that are working, in fact, uh, or that have worked on one of our EFE projects uh, in the last five years. And what we do with, with those is really ensure that there are positive outcomes for government, for businesses, for institutions, and of course for students. Uh, and this is specific to ensure that we integrate labor market needs in applied education to ensure that the curriculum is adapted to the needs of the business sector, of the industry, of the labor market of the community where we are. And uh, to ensure that in fact, uh, they are graduates and that those graduates are employed and able to provide for their families. So if we look at the, at the next one, gender. So of course for us, gender is a very, very important one. We know that for the federal government, it is also an extremely important one. Uh, as you know, they have this uh, uh, feminist uh, policy uh, that they, for all their international uh, work. And so uh, what's happening with the gender? In fact, we, we did a report about, I think about two years ago, and if you're interested, it is on our website but it's a report on best practices with respect to gender. And we've been extremely, extremely active uh, in that work. And uh, we used an approach that is called the uh, ENI, uh, it's like the French word friend. So ENI stands for gender equality, of course, but uh, first the approach is about A, access, 
so access to training. M is for maintenance of study or retention in the programs that you are uh, uh, registered in. I for integration into the labor market. And finally, E uh, for entrepreneurship or self-employment. And we think that this is part of the of the solutions, it is key to to think about gender with those uh, five uh, identifiers, if you want, from access to entrepreneurship. And we had uh, quite a very successful project uh, a couple of uh, few years ago with Mille Mujeres, uh, which was a thousand women to build the capacity of Brazilian women. Uh, that were marginalized uh, and to access job-specific training that fit with their passion and to allow them to enter the form formal workforce or strengthen their entrepreneurial uh, spirit or their entrepreneurial activity. And that uh, project was so successful that, in fact, it was scaled up at the national level by the Brazilian government. And so I could give you a number of examples. Uh, for example, what we have done uh, in Mozambique, where uh, we wanted to increase girls uh, and women's participation in training program, but especially uh, change the attitudes, uh, because that's often part of the issue. And we wanted to make sure that we would uh, change the attitudes with respect to women participating in STEM activities. And uh, we did what we call the Super Technica Outreach Campaign, which was uh, done to stimulate discussions among students, trainers, leaders, parents, on, on different themes that were linked to women, whether it was early marriage, uh, family planning, sexuality, uh, sexually transmitted disease, gender-based violence. And uh, so those were some of the themes that were discussed. And those aspects are very important because if we don't talk about those things, they could become barriers to learning for those young girls or those young women. And so, and this was very important. And what we discovered, what, the outcomes of that was that in fact, it helped recruitment. It helped uh, with respect to the retention of those girls and young women and to insert them in labor market as well. So uh, I'll just uh, finish by a last one that we did recently uh, that we are still doing uh, in the Pacific Alli uh, Alliance with respect to indigenous and women. So uh, we held, for example, the first forum on gender and uh, a second forum was held on the integrations of indigenous communities in technical and professional uh, and vocational training, especially in the mining sector where there is, in, in fact, there are a lot of opportunities. And we wanted to make sure that both indigenous people and that young uh, uh, girls or women would be part of that. And so for that, of course, we work on a number of, uh, of goals, not only five, but we work, for example, on uh, uh, SDG 8, 10, and 13. So the third one, you remember when I talked to you about the, the 5, the uh, 8, and the 13, so um, that were important, that were so linked to uh, SDG 4 that we are focusing on. So, of course, the greening is very important. And UNESCO, UNIVOC, as many of you know, uh, have identified five different aspects when we talk about uh, the, the greening 
uh, or, or, or uh, as we say, the actions on climate change. So it goes for from greening your, the campus, so meaning your facilities and all that, to greening the curriculum where you ensure that you integrate notions uh, of green skills, no matter which program that you are teaching from culinary arts to construction uh, to uh, photonics uh, or, or techni uh, techniques uh, of uh, laboratory for technicians in laboratory. Uh, then there is a green community. So what can you do to support your community around, to support the SMEs, uh, to ensure that you, uh, they, with you, uh, they embrace, you know, is it possible to do something with respect to reuse or recycling that would be an activities like one of the CEGEP in Quebec did, and where they put everybody that wanted uh, to get rid of some stuff, and then they invited people to to barter if you want, and it was a big success, and nothing was thrown away because you know what uh, is not of use anymore to someone becomes very useful to, to the other one. I should have mentioned on green curriculum something that Nova Scotia Community College is doing. In fact, it, that is quite interesting because. Uh, whenever a new person arrives uh, in their uh, college in Nova Scotia, whether you're the janitor, whether you are a, a support person, whether you are a faculty or an administrator, you have to take uh, the equivalent of about 35 or 37 hours uh, where you 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 get it in the you go into the spirit of the greening, and so that it will influence your way of teaching or your way of working. So it's it's quite interesting. So uh, green research, of course, and uh, thanks to uh, so many colleges involved in applied research, there's so much that is happening on that front. And finally, ensure a green culture a green attitude uh, that's extremely important, not only uh, from uh, faculty, not only from staff and administrators, but also uh, for um, students to ensure that you will also have to influence their way of being, their way of doing, or their way of playing. Uh, when they will, uh, once they will have uh, graduated. Uh, the next one is maybe uh, to give you a snapshot of uh, SDG 17 and how we are embracing it at the CI Can, at Colleges and Institutes Canada. So the first one, and it's available on our website, don't hesitate to download it. It was our first tool, uh, OER, so Open Education Resources. It's a SDG toolkit that we launched during uh, Global Goals Week in September. And uh, it is highlighting promising best practices from our members. It's a guide that will be updated quarterly with new initiatives. In fact, we launched, I think, uh, yesterday. Uh, the, uh, the the request for new uh, ideas that people want to to put uh, in the in the toolkit. We also signed, and we're very very proud of that. We signed on behalf of all our members the SDG Accord um, in September, also to signal our commitment, in fact, to United Nations Decade to deliver on the SDG. And we are the first pan-Canadian stakeholder to sign the accord. So uh, we are very, very proud of that. The other thing that we've heard from our members uh, that they wanted to, to us to, to uh, focus on was mentorship. So 
they said, look, there are some colleges that are very advanced with the SDGs and others that are starting. So what could we do? So we've developed a fabulous uh, mentorship guide, in fact, to help and support this, uh, this um, embracing of the SDGs. And uh, we have launched a call, in fact, for up to five mentors and five mentees to pilot test our approach. So we're very excited. So if there's a desire uh, to, uh, for, you know, that you have to be either a mentor or a mentee in this initiative, don't hesitate uh, to let us know. And after the goal is that we we uh, implement it uh, at a full-scale mentoring program on the SDG, SDGs. And finally, if you don't receive it yet, I do invite you to uh, register to it uh, to get our impactful updates. So it's like a newsletter, if you want. It's monthly, and it gives you in a snapshot the latest resources, events, uh, or opportunities or even reports uh, that uh, you may want to hear uh, about, or we talk to you about the, the different, uh, different other initiatives that could be uh, inspiring. The, the last one that I want to say, uh, again, it's another view of uh, the uh, SDG. And I want to flag to you um, that we also have a community of practice at the, uh, with CICAN on the SDG. So if you're not part of it, you know, make sure that you register to the newsletter and say that you want to be part of, of, this, uh, of this group. We also have a, a youth group. There are 20 of them. They are extraordinary, and they give us the pulse, uh, the pulse of what's happening, what's important, how we can better engage students. And right when we began to embrace the SDGs, we created this group. And uh, it, we, we now we realize we could not continue uh, we could not go without such a, such a group. We have uh, four uh, working groups, in fact, uh, that are uh, linked to our work on the SDGs. Currently, those four working groups, um, we work on different aspects, such as social entrepreneurship, uh, inclusiveness and access uh, on greening, of course, so the sustainability, and finally, uh, SDG Accord Working Group. So those groups are uh, extremely, extremely important. Uh, this, uh, those groups are supported by some funding that we got from the McConnell Foundation, so we are very, very pleased about that. And of course, with the patronage of uh, UNESCO, um, those groups uh, are uh, working uh, together and among different members from across the country. So it's uh, it's a great group to to work uh, with. And finally, uh, I want to talk about the potential for you to be involved with an international group. Uh, of professional and technical education and training uh, that is looking at the SDGs. Canada is leading that initiative, so if you're interested, just write to us. We'll be pleased to uh, uh, invite you to uh, the first meeting that will be uh, held, uh, in fact, in January. It's very exciting. We're working with uh, other countries as well on this. And I'll take the opportunity also to mention those affinity groups are really uh, to share best practices and learn from each other. And I'll take this opportunity to flag or to make a, a small ad, if I, I may, for the other affinity groups of the uh, World Federation that covers a variety of aspects from applied research to indigenous education. So if you're interested in any of them, don't hesitate to write me an email. 
I will be pleased to uh, ensure that I connect you with the lead. And as you can see, uh, Canada is leading four of those affinity groups or co-leading. And we are looking right now for a co-lead uh, for Indigenous education also. So if you're interested, let us know. So I'll stop here. It was a pleasure to be with you. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Denise. Uh, you are an amazing ambassador to our sector. And uh, the, the things you've discussed and shared with us today have the potential for such profound impact to humans across the planet. So um, very, very impressive. Look forward to hearing what our, our audience uh, looks to gain more information on in our Q&A. Thank you. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Herb. Um, I want to say that I've really enjoyed the uh, the first two panels, and I, I think you're panelists, and I think that you'll 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 hear uh, the connections that we have in the views that we have towards the SDGs. The title of my portion of the panel, "Local to Global Education and Internationalization," reflects both an approach and a journey that we're taking at Sheridan as we address the SDGs. There are three aspects of our developing initiatives to embed the SDGs that I'll outline today. Number one is the need to engage learners in real-world interdisciplinary community problem-solving at the local level as a means to develop capacity to support achieving the SDGs and as a basis for global citizenship and internationalization. The second area that I'll address is the role that partnerships need to play in this process as a means to develop organizational capacity and increase impact. I'll also outline the importance of a pan-institutional approach to the SDGs. Next slide, please. An institution's local context and capacity for implementation of the SDGs is important. The SDGs are national in scope, but over 65% of the targets actually need to be addressed through some form of local engagement. The SDG framework also includes an emphasis on the relevance of the goals for all countries, regions, and communities throughout the world. In our case, our three campus communities, Oakville, Mississauga, and Brampton, include two of the top 10 largest cities in Canada, with a total regional population of over 2 million people. These municipalities include some of the fastest growing, ethnically diverse, and largest immigrant populations in Canada. We have a large student body within five faculties, including a range of expertise areas in business, applied health and community studies, animation arts and design, humanities and social sciences, and applied sciences and technology. Our research and entrepreneurship centers mirror this comprehensive expertise. We have a mix of 130 programs, including 25 degree programs with internship and co-op opportunities, as well as applied research-based courses that enable student engagement in projects involving real world problem solving. With more than 155 faculty and staff engaged in research, and approximately $5 million external funding generated annually to support research, Sheridan has both research scale and breadth. So how does this factor into the SDGs at Sheridan? We have the interdisciplinary expertise, as well as significant capacity and experience in community and industry partnerships required to address complex problems at a local level. We're located in three communities that include significant cultural and ethnic diversity each with its own specific manifestations of the challenges encompassed by the goals. Embedding the SDGs at a local level will help develop the foundation for internationalization efforts by both fostering a perspective or mindset based on just and sustainable development and building the capacity and competencies of our students. This example of considering local context and opportunities as an example of holistic embedding of the SDGs will of course be different for each institution, but it's a very important way to approach the SDGs. Next slide, please. Despite the opportunity that this creates, we're still at a relatively early stage of implementation of the SDGs at Sheridan within our curriculum, research, operations and governance, and community partnerships. We have a strong history of social and economic innovation but the actual use of the SDG framework 
has only been taking place in specific areas of the institution until about a year or so ago when activities were accelerated. So what changed at this point? Two things, both, both external and external developments have collided with really exciting opportunities and potential for advancing our incorporation of the SDGs. External developments around the role of the SDGs within the national and global post-secondary environment, as well as increased awareness of the commitment to the SDGs among our community partners, have been major drivers for our recent progress on the SDGs. Partnerships and collaboration have been essential. On a national level, our President Janet Morrison is on the Presidential Advisory Board for IMPACT, the CICAN initiative supporting development of the SDGs within their member colleges and institutes across Canada. Through our discussions with CICAN, we became aware of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network Canada and the larger global SDSN network. SDSN includes post-secondary institutes and research centres across Canada and around the world that are building awareness and implementation of the SDGs. We became members at the beginning of 2020 and through participation in SDSN took part in a national conference earlier this year together Ensemble that raised our awareness of approaches to building capacity for the SDGs within post-secondary institutions. Simultaneously, in the fall of last year, our entrepreneurship hub EDGE became involved in a regional partnership with six community foundations administering the Investment Readiness Program, a Canadian government fund to support social enterprise. Community Foundations of Canada, the umbrella organization, is one of the major national organizations helping to build capacity around the SDGs. In addition, the increased global attention on the required role of post-secondary institutions in achieving the global goals has given rise to the Times Annual Higher Education Impact Rankings that assess universities against the SDGs. This year, four Canadian universities were ranked in the top 20 of the world, again highlighting for us the type of work that we can aspire to and learn from. As a result, the SDGs have become more front and centre. External collaborations, partnerships and knowledge sharing on a national and international level have become key contributors to our work in this area. Next slide, please. In, in any institution, internal commitment to the approach to the SDGs is a really critical aspect of building awareness and implementation. Linking or mapping what's, what's already being done or aspired to within the institution can support embedding the, the SDGs within areas throughout the institution, including internationalization. This is a key aspect of localizing the goals as a means to embed them in an organization's culture and practice. In our case, the external developments I've just described were coincidentally aligned with internal developments at Sheridan that provided evidence of this aligned commitment. After an unparalleled internal engagement process, in late 2019, our new institutional strategic plan was released. This statement from Janet Morrison, Sheridan's president, gives you some indication of the unique alignment. Sheridan 2024 is an actionable strategy for unlocking people's potential, fueling economic and social development, and making Sheridan an even more powerful force in the world. Of additional relevance to the SDGs and internationalization, the plan is based on first principles that include the belief that we have the capacity to fulfill individual potential and collectively find the answers to the tough questions facing our world. A second principle puts forward the belief that we are better humans and make more meaningful choices when we make generative connections across worldviews, life experiences, cultures, and disciplines. The connections to the SDGs is obvious. Within the, within the plan, there's also a commitment to holistic internationalization. The recent establishment of the Centre for Global Education and Internationalization at Sheridan is a manifestation of the plan. Internationalization at Sheridan has been inward focused for too long, with a primary attention to attracting international students. The path forward, consistent with, whole, consistent with holistic internationalization, includes diversifying the types of international connections and partnerships. Based on the publication of the strategic plan, a first phase in the process of localizing the SDGs began with mapping Sheridan's strategic plan onto SDG targets and indicators. The, re the result, which was no surprise, is that SDG 4 
quality education is the most dominant goal alignment found throughout the plan. It was interesting for us, though, to, to also discover that the mapping identified goals within all five of the SDG categories, people, planet, profit, peace, and partnerships. This analysis of the institution's strategic alignment with the SDGs is being followed by a current state assessment of SDGs on campus throughout various faculties and departments. In keeping with this institutional approach, an expanding informal working group of the SDGs was formed several months ago. It currently includes individuals from areas including the Center for Equity and Inclusion, Center for Global Education and Internationalization, EDGE Entrepreneurship Hub, the Office for Sustainability, Integrated Planning, and student representation through our SDG Youth Coordinator, who works with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network Canada. Next slide, please. As a final section of my presentation, I'd like to return to the role that building a culture and practice and competencies around the SDGs at a local level can play in simultaneous development of a holistic approach to internationalization. These are unprecedented times. The global scale and depth of change and disruption in 2020 has touched every aspect of our lives and highlighted the equities within our communities and the imperative to build resilience individually, organizationally, and at the community level. We're at a point in time that, that all of us are required to step up and help find ways to reach and amplify underrepresented voices, to spark inclusive dialogue, to embrace, not hide from, the forces of disruption prevalent in society, and to cultivate meaningful solutions. At Sheridan, we want to catalyze this change in an area we know well, learning and education. As a result, we're launching the Reimagine Learning and Education in Our Communities Challenge later this week. We'll be seeking engaged participants and community partners to get involved at both the local level and across the country. The challenge, which aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, includes a three-stage process that runs until May 2021. We'll be facilitating brainstorming, dialogue, ideation, and co-creation of solutions at local levels and at the national level around the question, how might we collaborate within our communities to reimagine learning and education so that no one is left behind and all youth and adults can realize their full potential? We recognize that we can't do this alone. We're pleased to have TD Insurance as a, as a presenting sponsor and look forward to engaging participants and partners in this challenge as we move forward together. Participation will take place on a leading open innovation technology platform. The first stage, the inspiration stage, calls on a diverse range of voices to contribute, contribute their experience with learning and education. Throughout the challenge, more than $60,000 in prizes are available to be won. The challenge is designed to galvanize individuals, individuals and organizations locally, regionally, and nationally to address the role that learning and education can play in issues of critical importance throughout our communities. The approach is aligned with the goal target of ensuring that all learners have the capacity and competencies to play a role in ensuring that no one is left behind. For this challenge, we're focused on dialogue, dialogue and solutions in the Canadian context, recognizing that local voices and regional social, economic, and historical circumstances are the foundation for more immediate impactful solutions. We look forward, however, to using this challenge as a path to dialogue with those in other countries who are addressing similar challenges and to sh sharing insights and solutions with others throughout the world. Challenge details will be available through the Sheridan website and a variety of other media later this week. Next slide, please. As a conclusion, I'd like to just follow up and, and, and summarize that I've, I've given you a glimpse into our work at, at Sheridan that, that really is, is intended as an example of some of the, the approaches that we've taken that, that hopefully could be useful for others. I've presented three aspects of our institutional approach to embedding the SDGs, which also form a basis for holistic internationalization. Local action based on the SDGs as a means to build a culture and practice of sustainable development. Partnership building at the local, regional, national, and international levels, as well as an institutional approach to building capacity around the SDGs. I hope this has been helpful. 
and look forward to any questions and, and also to following up uh, in conversations with anybody who would like to get in touch. Thank you. John, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, really glad you, you sort of brought out this, this um, change in perspective uh, that's evolved, um, not only within Sheridan, but I see it within other institutions we deal with, this sense of uh, um, the work and effort we put in our local communities and the support we provide in our local communities. And beginning to adopt and frame and becoming adept at this kind of duality that lets us think about uh, what we're doing locally to ensure nobody's left behind, um, but also then ensuring that same thing in a larger global context and framing our work in a, in a, in a much bigger context. Um, and I'm, you know, in line with that, I'm perpetually struck by just how much impact the developed world, particularly maybe, maybe I would sort of lump together those countries that fall in OECD as a sort of a simple basket to put us in, but how much impact we have on the rest of the world um, in terms of climate change, the effects of the supply chain, uh, all of the things an institution and organization does um, end up with ramifications that are global. And, and, um, and, you know, reflecting back to what Charles shared with us, uh we sort of think about uh and at Sheridan we talk frequently about this need to prepare our learners for a world that's increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. These these factors uh one could argue are um really indications of systems that at one time served us quite well. Um but are, are now beginning to, to show signs of weakness as we uh, as we deal with these more um, significant emerging global problems. And uh, there's a very clear parallel um, between this need and all the methods, practices, and um, uh, 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 and strategies that are emerging from from the education for sustainable development, global citizenship education, um, particularly that need to be able to drive transformation and transformative change, which um, often historically has been taken as an approach to problem solving, let's solve specific problems. But uh, the nature of what makes these wicked problems, as Charles put them, is that they are, in fact, transformational shift. We are looking for that new construct. Um, we're looking to be able to um, collaboratively create social and economic constructs within which everyone can participate and that operates within global limits. So um, some really fascinating stuff uh, shared there. And um, just reflecting on what uh, Denise had shared with us, um, from, a, from an obvious focus in SDG4 on access to education, you can see how quickly the impact branches as we move to uh, thinking about SDG8 and um, and how uh, communities and, and members of communities can uh, meaningfully participate and work in the economic growth of their communities to uh, how to foster um, uh, uh, gender equality or uh, an ability to mobilize the 50% of our workforce that is being uh, uh, left in the margin and not, not able to participate. Um, and then the um, the very tactical focus on on how do we address the existential crisis we're in that um, that our climate abusive practices need to fundamentally change and transform. So really, really some some amazing insights. Um, I just want to point out to our audience that uh, Denise is is on two stages today, as she put it. So she's here talking with us, and she's also talking with another group. Uh, we've come to the Q&A portion of our chat. This is an opportunity for you to um, include your questions for our panelists in the Q&A section on the right-hand side of the screen. And we'll, I already see a few in here, and we'll address those. And um, Denise has returned, which is fantastic, so we have um, the opportunity then to, to direct questions to them. 
So maybe I'll ask the panelists if you can uh, turn on your cameras so that um, we can have a, a more open discussion here. And uh, thank you. And um, I'll just address uh, uh, it's sort of an initial question to our panelists to, to kick us off. Uh, so I, I got to ask the, you know, it's the elephant in the room question. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, it is indicative of those failing systems again in many ways, a symptom of um, the challenges of climate change, the rise of populism and nationalism. Um, these uh, this endemic of of um, racist episodes, um, a projected global recession, all of these factors create a certain urgency in the work. Are there any uh, alterations or uh, adjustments you're making to your practices at this point? To um, that, particularly in relation to our efforts with the UN SDGs. Um, any changes in focus? And maybe I'll, I'll direct that first to Charles and then ask our other panelists if they want to contribute. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the relevancy of the SDGs within uh, all levels of higher education are, um, are sort of front and center. We're seeing uh, through uh, not only the, the Times Higher Education rankings and so on, uh, <clears throat> But I, I think that uh, there is a tremendous student movement um, uh, pressuring up the, and inquiring, uh, you know, and concerned about their future. They're coming into post-secondary education from uh, higher, from uh, secondary and elementary school, where this is now, for the last 20 years, been part of their life. You know, they, they've been greening the, castle, the classroom and so on. Now they want to green the mind. They, they, and they're, they're questioning their lifestyle. They're, they're questioning who they are, who they want to be. And if our institutions do not take advantage of that, uh, it, it will be to our detriment, I really think. If I could just make one, one more quick point. I know you like short, short answers. Um, the importance of higher education globally is such that around the world, only about uh, six or seven percent of the world's population gets to go to post-secondary and graduate. It's very small, but they'll become 80 percent of the shapers of the world of the future. So what is our responsibility as educators? In, in trying to address that, that bigger issue. How, how can our graduates uh, not only uh, cope, but thrive and help to lead the world in all different aspects into a more sustainable future? Yeah. Now, now that we know, we can see we're on and on sustainable trajectory. So are we going to become a, a huge Easter Island, you know, this planet floating along? Or are we going to be able to do something about it? And we need to engage all our disciplines, the social sciences as well as the natural sciences and so on, it all need to play a role. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective that the, the, the skills that we are being asked to deliver and, uh, both from our customers, our client, and uh, and the world at large is is shifting and changing, and we we need to be malleable. Denise, John, do you want to uh, speak to this question of of how we shift? Sure. I mean, I, I just say a few words here. Is that I think that um, you know, from from my perspective, uh, uh, colleges are are uh, are very well placed uh, to uh, to address this situation. You know, we, we're uh, very Connected to our communities, uh, it's part of our mandate to to support uh, community uh, economic and social development. And I, I think that you know, as Charles says, has said, you know, really emphasizing the the fact that 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 youth uh, are are very committed to to uh, to social social impact and change, uh, and that there's an opportunity here, uh, as well as a responsibility. 
for us to uh, play a greater role with, within learning and education. You know, yes, we're post-secondary institutions, but, but we're, we're anchor institutions within our communities. So how can we ensure that we, we go beyond the, the, the education of the students that, that, that uh, we, we graduate, uh, have more power, more, more influence through the role that they play uh, when they do graduate, but also within our communities on a daily basis, you know, determine how we can have more impact on learning and education. So, Herbert? Yes, Denise. Okay. Uh, um, so, to answer your questions, uh, are there some that we should do more or not? The beauty of the 17 SDGs is that, in fact, they are comprehensive. They are touching all aspects, no matter which aspect uh, of, of life, of work, of play, they are all covered. And, of course, right now we, we talk about, a lot about um, anti-racism, anti-discrimination, uh, the, the Black Lives Movement, uh, uh, of course, you know, students or youth or there will be more attention being put towards those things or even uh, a green economic recovery. Uh, but what is important is always to think about the whole aspect uh, because at the end of the day, uh, and both Charles and John uh, mentioned it, uh, we are preparing uh, the citizen of the world, and it's important that we, we, we touch at different aspects of, of their life and how we can help them to impact the world. Thank you very much for that. Um, we, we've heard this, this theme uh, from each of you that the, the holistic lens is needed, that uh, I think Char I like Charles' analogy of uh, a patch in a quilt. That uh, you know we we can't. That's not going to keep us warm. We we have a focus that's bigger. Um, and and to some extent, uh, our organizations, our institutions will um, re react to what's happening in our environment on any given day. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm kind of segueing to a question that's popped up from our audience. Uh, a couple of the audience members asked whether, uh, it, as part of implementing SDGs in education, there um, we see a need to to make that education more globalized. Um, to to increase perspective and awareness of how uh, the SDGs apply both globally and locally, uh, and that if our objective, if one of our objectives, maybe not our sole objective because we're holistic, uh, but if one of our objectives is to reduce this sense of populism or nationalism, uh, sh should we, how do we <laughs> bring the world into our classroom then? You know, how do we transform um, that perspective that the student has from us? Uh, maybe I'll start that with you since I see you on my screen, Denise, and then uh, I'll ask the other panelists. Uh, yes. Um, so how can we bring the world into the classroom? In fact, by participating in the uh, call that we had to all colleges recently on this uh, pilot projects on uh, student outbound student mobility virtual now because of the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, it's over now. We've received all the, the deadline that has been achieved, but it's ensuring that you participate in the next call because we will have calls for the next five years and this is something we've been advocating a lot for funding for student mobility outbound because currently we know that only between two and three percent of our students in colleges and institutes uh, travel overseas and when they do most of the time it's U.S. 
Australia, UK, France, or I'm forgetting one, but it's a, it's a typical one. Uh, and uh, so, and of course, uh, the, uh, those that program is to ensure they will go somewhere else, not necessarily in those. And for 50% of the students, they have to be from vulnerable groups. So we are very, very happy about that initiative. But of course, you can bring the world into any of your program. Um, uh, because, you know, whether you, you teach environment, whether you teach, uh, in fact, uh, uh, nursing or if you teach uh, I, I'm, electricity, there's nothing preventing you to talk about how it is in other parts of the world, how it is, and, you know, how lucky we are in, in Canada uh, to be the way we are and what can we do, us as, as future workers, uh, future graduates, uh, how can we ensure that we think holistically about the SDGs, and I'm always coming back to the SDGs, because what's very interesting, when it was the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, it was always seen as, oh, this is for, you know, countries in development, this is not for us, you know, it's about us, what can we do for them? Uh, so the SDGs have taken a whole new approach, which I think is for the better, because SDGs is for all of us, no matter how we are. And in fact, Canada is not doing so well in all the SDGs. We have work to do, and that work will only be able to uh, accomplish it if we all put uh uh, en français, je dirais l'épaule à la roue. If we all work in the same direction, it's not exactly that, but I forgot how we say that in French, in English. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and um, and what an interesting place to be in Canada, as you say. The world needs Canada, uh, and uh, and there's so much respect for what we can offer in in all of that context. Charles or John, do you want to uh, talk a, a little about uh, uh, this this notion of uh, bringing the world to our classroom and, and how uh, how we, we shrink the boundary and increase the perspective of our students? Well, I I think uh, first of all, being in um, in this part of Canada, <laughs> in Toronto with its multiculturalism and so on, we can we can. Uh, and certainly get the discussions going in our in our classrooms about how things are are in in other places of the world etc but i think it uh it it needs to start with the idea of global goals and local goals to get the the discussion of the uh the these are are, are what collectively the people around the world identified through that program of the world we want. And, and then start thinking about um, the Canada we want, the, the Oakville we want, the, you know, what, whatever. And, and what are really the, the issues that, that need to, uh, to change? Uh, how can I be relevant? How can my discipline uh, uh, be relevant? So I think within the structure of of, uh, of our institutions, we need to make sure that all of our graduates, first of all, have a, a concept of uh, of change, the concept of coping with change, and trying to get that change in the right direction, so that we do have a sustainable future, sustainable development, and, and so on. So it's the concept, but then the next step is how does that apply to your to your world of work that we're largely, but how does it apply to your own well-being? And how are you going to deal with, you've mentioned the wicked issues a couple of times, there are two kinds. There are the wicked issues of which we know something about, climate change, for instance. Then there are the wicked issues that are thrust upon us, like COVID, where we we really don't know that much about it, and how do 
how do I apply the, the learning skills that I acquire at Sheridan or whatever the institution is? You see, what makes sense? What should I be doing? What is complete nonsense? You know, and, 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 and being media literate and so on. These are, are the wicked issues that somehow our institutions also need to, uh, to apply. So it's concept and then down to, to me and then the third step, what do I do about it? It's not just being aware, but it's doing something. Well, that's a fantastic answer, and, and actually, um, I'm, I'm going to thread another question from the audience into that because I think it's related. Um, the, the question is, systemic transformative change is difficult. It's often a slow process. So uh, many students begin to then feel helpless and anxious about the future. How can we as teachers, educators, uh, administrators bring these, these really daunting complex issues into the classroom? Um, in, including the the uh, our our, um, our higher education institutions. So Charles, I mean, I think I think you were kind of getting at the answer of that. I wonder, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask John to to uh, see if you want to unpack that a bit, and then um, we've got a few minutes left to hear from other panelists. Sure. I mean, I, I see that being done at Sheridan all the time. You know, in the sense that they're not talking about the SDGs necessarily. But, but um, you know, how do, how do we uh, carry out our work in, in, in different areas of, of, uh, of community action, of, of, of uh, uh, different programs, of, of, uh, you know, within the arts, et cetera, you know, in a way that really enables us to uh, understand how our, our uh, uh, how that system change doesn't mean that it's this big, Thing that you're going to push over and, and it's going to fall over. That that it, it, it's made up of of, uh, of of so many different ways that people can can interact uh, in terms of, of advocacy of of, uh, of uh, engagement with with people in, in a variety of different ways through 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 media through through the the you know a, a short video you make uh, something you do in terms of a you know engineering in terms of a, a, a shift. An innovation that, in some way, you know, results in saving some energy, but 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 is understood within the context that other people around the world, other people that w within your your local community, other people around your world are working on the same things, and that's that's part of what the SDGs do for us is that they give us this opportunity to 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 have a conceptual framework that that's linked to what business is looking at right now, what community groups are looking at right now, what government. So it's not just national and international. Is also across sectors, so it has relevance that 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 can can be really drawn out based on the particular initiatives that people are are, are uh, taking within their particular area. So, uh, on this one, Herbert, what I would say is that um, I, I would encourage students to have a, a discussion about what is it that they are passionate about. What is it that they would like to transform? What's the difference they want to make? And they can start small, you know. I've seen some institutions where it all started with stopping to have plastic bottles in the, in the, in the institution. And from there, it, it, they, they did way more after and, uh, ensure that you measure the impact, you know, of, uh, of the decisions that have been taken and how you are uh, supporting it. But uh, I would say uh, start small and ask the students what is the legacy that they want to leave behind, and you'll see you'll be surprised. Lovely. What a wonderful note to end this session on. I think today we've had a, a fantastic discussion about how integral education, post-secondary education is to realizing the ambitions of the SDGs to really transform and shape our world of 2030. We've seen a number of practical examples of work that's being done to shift our communities of practice, to really dig into these difficult transformations that are ahead of us and really mobilize this generation of young adults that, that's uh, not only gonna help us realize all these ambitions, but, but are really facing 
the most significant repercussions of what we do now. So I encourage uh, each of us coming away today to reflect on everything that was shared. Uh, consider how our individual and collective practices are aligning to these challenges and really continuing to support and advocate for that transformative change. My thanks very much to Charles, Denise, and John. Wonderful job today. Uh, thank you on behalf of all of our audience, who I'm sure would love to uh, to jump in, and thanks. I hope um, those of you on the call will join us tomorrow and Thursday for other two webinars in the series, and the recording of today's webinar should be available soon on our website. Thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day and week. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Take care.